actually last week I was shooting filming and I opened the drapes to in my hotel room and there were apartment buildings 10, 000, it had to be 10,000 room our apartments all I mean apartments apartment front, and then a whole huge building of apartments facing them and I know they all, they all had telescopes <laughs> looking at me. You know, you know, what are 10,000 people locked in their apartments going to do? There's a hotel over there. Let's look who's doing what to whom in the hotel. Oh my God, I think I see Shatner. <laughs> you know that's what they were doing. If, if I can add a moment to that. When we went out to dinner last night, and we're riding in this, you know, SUV and Bill sitting in front of me with the window open and people kept walking by and going <laughs> and at one point this cab driver was staring at Bill and I rolled down, I was behind him, I rolled down my window and went <laughs> Well it's embarrassing So let's, why don't we uh, uh, start with a question see what's on everybody's mind and we'll go from there there's a microphone there. Somebody get up and ask a question. Otherwise, we don't know what to do. You know, what you've got to do is introduce yourself. I mean, you're standing there like dead quiet, not saying anything. So, so help us. So I'm, I'm Chris Ryle. I've been John's publisher at IDW for about a dozen years. Um, and we did Star Trek books for at least a decade together. And so only in the last few years did John start doing these photo comics, this sort of new format, this new style of telling stories, where he would take stills from the old Star Trek episodes and build new sets and new backgrounds and sort of move figures around and tell entirely new stories. So he basically created uh, an entire fourth season. Um, so I guess my first question, if I can kick things off, is how did it feel to put words in this actor's uh, character's mouth? Scary. <laughs> Um, although I did find that I knew that version of all those people from, you know, obsessively watching the episodes over and over and over and over. But it came fairly easily. I knew how Captain Kirk talked. I knew how Mr. Spock talked. But what did you have to do with it? I was the, uh, I was the chief creative officer at the company, so I oversaw all the publishing, and I was John's director. Uh, are you saying you hired John? I hired John. He's the one who got me so it started. was it your idea for this whole thing? It was my idea to hire John. No, but <laughs> well, that was a really good idea. Very no, idea. exciting idea. But but when you say John, you're hired, and he says, "What am I going to do?" Who says we're going to make a big book and, and do that? Well, so we started doing Star Trek comics, but I hired John. I said, "Hey, will you draw some comics?" And John said, "I don't want to do likenesses. I don't want to try to draw William Shatner's terrible at likenesses." So we did some comics where he drew. Well, so whose idea was to take the pictures? Okay, so that was your idea. But, but, but when you said, <coughs> "I'm going to hire," you notice they give you one little glass of water. <laughs> Um, can I both? John just give me his water. Did you taste it at all? It just, uh, no, no, don't, don't do that. My dog. You put your finger in my water? Where has that finger been? Oh, yeah. Nosy little bugger, isn't he? Um, who says, John, you're taking it too far now, John. That, your editor has just said, no, John, that won't work. Uh, uh, who's, you say, let's hire John Byrne, I mean, the, the great name, and, yeah. and, and then you say, you're not going to draw it, you're going to, who says we're going to do pictures? Well, so John started doing these on his own, John was drawing some Star Trek comics for us, but, you know, on a professional Us level. being? Us being the company, IDW, who published Star Trek comics. Uh, but John started playing with the photos and telling stories just on his website, just as a fun sort of lark. And he actually posted, these will never work, these will never get published. And I saw them and I said, they should be published. You! <laughs> that, he's being very modest, he's being very Canadian about his, his, uh... Yeah, but you're Canadian originally. I'm not Canadian originally, no. Get out of here. <laughs> I'm, I'm Canadian in the middle. What does that mean? It's I was English at first, and then I'm Canadian. Uh, I didn't vote for 
for Trump. Did you just say? Well, we got that established. What's your question? Yeah, long time fan from Captain Kirk. No, you got to get right close to the mic and speak up. It's all okay. Right. There you go. Perfect. All right. So I followed your career uh, for a long hey, you time. You talk to me. You talk to I'm me. I'm talking to you. <laughs> okay. So my question is, um, until Captain Kirk was my favorite character ever, until Denny Crane. So my question. That's all right. Yeah. My question for you is, yeah. Boston Legal had continued. What happens to Denny Crane, in your opinion? Or what would you want for him? <laughs> right, that's funny. John. I have a child, I named him John Byrne. Without him. And he too becomes senile. <laughs> uh, speculation, I don't know. Uh, but uh, doing that show was great fun. It was beautifully written uh, uh, by David E. Kelly, and uh, uh, I, had a, I had a great experience for five years on uh, Boston Legal. Uh, James Spader is a great guy, a wonderful actor, great guy. You know, the... the I hate that. You know, it's either great guy or... Okay, leave it alone, but it's a... Yeah. So, I mean, and the, the um, I, I guess the, the most interesting thing now that that's all over, at least for me, uh, hi everybody, um, is uh, the phenomenon of being friendly uh, with members of the cast uh, and your bosom buddies. I mean, uh, you're, you're at war to get. You're taking over my position. <laughs> You're at war. He told me to do it. Uh, he's, the, he's the guy who invented this whole thing. That's why we're here. You, you establish a relationship with your fellow actors. And it, it, you, it's almost like being in the foxhole uh, in, in war because every day for 10, 12, 14 hours a day, you and the other people in the, in the, in, in the cast are saying words and working long and trying to do well. And sometimes it's good and sometimes it's bad. And you're you're enthused and enraged and uh, you eat together. And this went on with uh, James and, uh, and I uh, and me. Uh, James and me. It went on with me. Uh, James and me. Pro proper English. We're in Toronto. And uh, and, and for five years. And you make these lifelong uh, uh, friends, or so it would seem. Then the show is over, and you, 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 you might say, like I did to James, uh, I'll call you uh, next week. Well, I didn't, yeah. Oh, uh, no, I can't call you next week. Um, I got an appointment, I'll call And you never call. And I have never seen James since we uh, finished that show. He got busy, I got busy, but I've never seen him. And that's what happens. So I wrote a book on uh, Leonard Nimoy. The same thing could have happened with, with Leonard, who had become a, a brother after three years and, uh, and a lot of mutual experiences. I really, I really loved him. And it would have happened the same way. He would have gone his way, would have gone mine. But we began to do shows like this and made films together. And, and then we began to have dinner and our wives and, and our families just intertwined. So, uh, Leonard became a, a very dear friend, but unusual because what is more usual is somebody like James Spader, where the intricate relationship uh, involved and wrapped around so many things, suddenly there's a, a cleavage and you never, you never see each other. Casts do that quite frequently. Is it, does it do the same in what you guys do? You have uh, deep relationships and all of a sudden they go their way and you go your way? Yeah, very, very much so. You know, uh, why would that be? Well, part of it is uh, fans have this illusion that we all work in the same uh, office. Uh, closer to the mic and, and slower. Fans have... Now, now say words. <laughs> <laughs> that would be John's editor. 
Yeah, there you go. Okay, fans have this illusion that we all work in the same office and hang out with each other and, you know, go out drinking at night and things like that. But we all are scattered all over the country. And uh, Joe Sinnott, for example, who was the anchor on the Fantastic Four with Jack Kirby, didn't meet Jack Kirby until something like 27 years after they were no longer working together. You know, that's how crazy this business is. I mean, when I was doing the X-Men, I lived in Calgary. <laughs> And no, nobody likes Calgary. Nobody got that Because they got that fake CN Tower, and it just... Um, and I and Chris lived in New York, so we'd see each other maybe twice a year, talk on the phone a lot. Um, and the internet, of course, has created this... Uh, I was up in the show in Boston, and my, one of Howard Mackey, who's a writer, in case you don't know that, one of my best friends, and we realized, although we email each other and talk to each other all the time, being together at the Boston show was the first time we had actually breathed the same air in seven years. And that's that's how, you know, these guys have this tight, intimate, on the sound stage, in each other's faces all day, and we're spread all over the country, and somehow... You know, and so, the, and so that's a modern relationship, isn't it? Yeah. People, uh, uh, whatever the words are, the text, and, 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 and you never see each other. I, when all this texting began and my kids were typing away and I'd say, why, why don't you pick up the phone? And instead of typing hello and sending it, why don't you pick up the phone and say hello? We're all trying to catfish each other. No, but I mean, it, it, there's, there's no intimacy. It's all, hello, I'm looking forward to seeing you, but you don't really mean it. You've taken, <laughs> yeah, well, you, you've decided that it's much seeing forward. you. Yeah. Exactly, that's how you would draw it if you were better. Uh, and it's, and it's, and you, every relationship is at arm's length or, or longer than that, but there's no intimacy. The, as an actor, I'm always reading voices. I walk around a lot hoping nobody's looking at me. I walk to the airport like this, but I'm listening to what's going on. So if somebody says on the phone, hello, you can read that hello, you know what that person's feeling from the first uh, moment they speak, uh, and you're tuned in. But if you type hello or um, uh, I love you, it's, it's cold. And, and I must say that in, in the last many years, I too have succumbed to writing these things. It's, it, 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 there's an efficiency about it. There's no warmth. It's just, I love you, and somebody says, oh, great, he loves me. And, uh, how do I get from that to uh, th this uh, country music album I've got up there? Uh, it just occurred to me that <clears throat> I made an album. I made actually two. But uh, Why Not Me is a country music album that I've got up there right now. Okay, yes, that's a, it's a boom. And, uh, and, and the method of doing it combines both, now I understand what my mind was telling me, combines both what we're talking about, the coldness of texting and the warmth of the human voice. So uh, a guy by the name of Brian Curl, Heartland Records, uh, says to me, I think it was texting too, uh, how would I like to make a country music album with Jeff Cook of the group Alabama? So I say, that's exactly what I'm going to go. So I then say, what do I sing? Now, in Nashville, they have a cookery of, I mean, numbers, who knows how many people standing around, sitting in their homes, in an office, writing songs. Not only are they writing songs, but many of them are great performers in their own right. So they started sending me songs over the phone performed by the writer who in themselves could have been or might very well be great performers who are just waiting to break out. But their interpretation of their song was really good. So eventually uh, Jeff Cook and I chose 12 songs and I had them on my phone. And then I had a lot of things to do. We made an appointment. Uh, to, to, for me to appear in Nashville for 
uh, a few days to record, like a month away. So for a month, I had this phone to my ear listening to a, a, a performer whom I've never seen. I, I, I don't know their name. I mean, the name is obviously published now, and I'd have to read what who wrote the song. But I listened every day to this person, usually a man, singing this song that I had chosen, and I began to acquire his mannerisms as I learned the song. Twelve songs. I ended up flying from Germany to Nashville uh, one week and uh, got there late uh, to Nashville, got there late on a Monday uh, night, like about midnight, 10 o'clock Tuesday morning, I was in front of a microphone at Jeff Cook's studio and I was laying down my tracks to the songs that I had learned from these marvelous performers who had written them. So I never have met the songwriters, never had met Jeff Cook until I saw him in Nashville, intimately learning these songs, going in and in one day laying down my tracks for 12 songs, and the record's out now, and I bet a half a dozen people. And I put a, and, and there's this country music album that's out there, a combination of the technology we're talking about along with the intimacy of the human being. And that's the 21st century right there. That's, that's, that's my point, exactly. Now, I've got a, um, a, a uh, Christmas album called Shatner Claus, <laughs> which will be out in October, and the totally different, uh, working with an engineer and a composer and, a, and, and uh, taking uh, uh, standard Christmas songs and bending them slightly so, and, and making, uh, 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 have, doing, having fun with them and doing well with them. But also, and here's the human factor, I had met a soldier who had a great deal of trauma from being in Afghanistan, American soldier. And I didn't know it when I met him, but gradually realized this man was a great poet. And, and the poetry he was writing was about battle and about how terrible it is. And I said, this is the beginnings of a one-man show. Can you write what happened before you got into the Marines poetry and after you were discharged and what's going on now? And he was unable to. All he could do was write about the torment of battle. So then I said to him, can you write a Christmas song? And he wrote this, I think, epic poem about a soldier in Afghanistan or, or Iraq, whatever the country was. And what's it like at home? Are the, are the lights uh, uh, lit at home? Because over here, it's not. And I put music to it, and it anchors the whole album, the Christmas album, that epic poem with music is a great Christmas moment about soldiers over there, home over here. So that album has a great deal of humanity in it as against uh, uh, the combination of it with uh, uh, the, the country music album. Uh, the, uh, I thought that might be of interest to you. I find that absolutely fascinating. What's your next question? Well, Mr. Shatner, uh, I've always wondered, since you're obviously a horse aficionado, uh, how and uh, when did your love for horses initially start? How wonderful, yes. Well, you know, um, there is, I've been reading a great deal about um, memory, about, uh, I'm trying to think of the right words, genetic memory. Are you aware of uh, what, I, what that phrase? <clears throat> what I mean by that is there is in us, we're a product of many strains of our humanity, but also we go far beyond that. We are a product of the evolution of this magnificent 
thing we call life. They shot a crayfish, electric shot. They made it very nervous. They were reading it electronically. And they, then they soothed it with medication that they give us for anxiety. And the crawfish stopped being so nervous, proving that as basic an entity as a crawfish has the same neural networks that we have. So that we are the, that these more primitive animals have laid down a neural network that is like game trails back when the country was being discovered. And explorers would go through where game had gone, through the mountains and through the valleys, because it was the most efficient way. Those game trails today have become superhighways. We are the superhighways of those neural networks. But there is the possibility that we have embedded in us memory. And especially more, more recently, our grandparents and, and our great-great-grandparents had abilities and had experiences that they remembered that became part of them that are now part of us. And we don't recognize that. We do something, we say, where did that come from? And it may very well come from these, these, these nerves that we have no, no, no idea what's happening. So that's by way of explaining. For some reason, I had uh, a fascinating interest in horses, even when I was a kid. I couldn't afford it, didn't afford it for the longest time until I could, and somehow, in my full maturity, I started riding horses. And it's become my, a way of life. Uh, people say, God, you're that age, and how do you, how do you, how are you able to still walk? <laughs> and I say, I get up every morning thinking, I've got to exercise, I've got to stay in shape because I'm riding competitively. Now, I just won a world championship last week. In <laughs> I've been voted in to the Rainers, that's a, a equine sport, Hall of Fame in uh, November. I'm going to Oklahoma to be ushered into the Hall of Fame uh, as a Rainer. It's a huge honor. I prize that honor with, with anything that's been given to me as an actor. I prize though that, and, and I was inducted into the Hall of Fame for uh, 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 Saddlebreds. I prize those honors equally with, with anything I've received as an actor because there's something mystical for me about a horse and a man. And when I ride, and when I'm at my best, and the horse, there's a unity, there's a Zen feeling of unity with the horse that I have had as an actor. Like right now, like right now. We're, we're connected right now. You and I, if I had something important to tell you, <laughs> we would be receiving. You're looking at me like, I'm feeling right now this bomb that we're having as, a, as an actor and as, a, as an audience. That kind of thing is, is, is uh, possible in anything you do. If the focus is there, you can unify yourself with whatever it is you're doing, and that's when you're at your best. I'll bet that happens to you when, you, when you're conceiving a, a, a work of art. Is it not sure? Yeah, I feel like I'm plugged into something larger than me. Describe that. Oh, thanks. <laughs> um, well, there's an old joke about uh, where do you get your inspiration? Inspiration. And I say, through my left elbow. But uh, it's, it's a part, let's get, let's get pretentious for a moment, shall we? It's, it's a part of the whole process of life that I am effectively, as an artist, I'm a videotape recorder that's always on and I'm absorbing and I'm picking stuff up and I look at this crowd and I'm sure faces from this crowd are going to turn up in my book somewhere because they've imprinted and 
I'll walk down the street and something somebody's wearing, and it all goes back to this. It, is it conscious, John? Do you say, oh, that's a flowing cape? I, sometimes, I'm, sometimes it's conscious. Sometimes I, I feel it click into place. I say, oh, yeah, there's that. But then a lot of times I'll think, oh, where did I get this? This came from some greater experience that is life and what you're talking about, about this genetic memory and all that kind of stuff, you know. I had false memories of World War II because my parents and grandparents talked about it all the time when I was a child. So I remember the Blitz, even though it was over five years before I was born. Well, you know, that's amazing. That applies to all of us. I think that every individual has that ability, and sometimes life, uh, the the routine of life dulls it over and you forget. But every so often, maybe in your dreams, maybe in a moment of stillness, you remember. And it's very important to all of us to do that because that's, that's the magic of life. Everything else is, you know, mechanical. But those inspirational moments, whether it's making a, a, a pot pie or, or, or drawing or riding a horse, it's inspirational. That's where we should be alive. We were having a fascinating conversation last night about artificial intelligence and the ability, or the coming ability of artificial intelligence to take over the world. I'm gonna tell you something I heard last night that is absolutely monumental, okay? This is, this is like news. Two artificial intelligent things, computers, talking to each other. They're each, they're teaching each other what each other knows, okay? AI, teaching each other what each other knows. <clears throat> and the people who invented, <clears throat> invented the machines are listening, and they're like, they're fascinated because one thing builds on the other, and, and, it, it, and it's producing a logic, but it's getting closer and closer to being inspirational, and all of a sudden, they're talking, and the people, the human beings listening to it, don't understand what the machines are saying, because what the machines are saying is, English is inefficient, Let's invent our own language, and they start talking in their own language, and the scientists shut it down because they don't know what the artificial intelligent machines are talking about. <laughs> now, how frightening is that? <laughs> so where, where does that lie in our future? And where do we lie in, uh, anticipating that future? And to me, Inspiration and these uh, racial memories and, and uh, uh, are the things that artificial intelligence can't have. What do you think? Well, if I can add a footnote to that. A exactly footnote. A footnote. A friend of mine uh, recently became a member of the scientific council that controls the doomsday clock. Are you all familiar with? No. What's the doomsday clock? The doomsday right? clock, since 1947, a group of scientists has gotten together every year and they've decided how close are we to annihilation. And they describe it with a clock. How many minutes are we from doomsday, from midnight? And for most of its existence, it has sat at two, three minutes to midnight. It began measuring our threat of nuclear annihilation. How close are we? to World War III. A few years ago, a few decades ago, they added the environmental threat as a component, the way we're destroying the environment. How close does that bring us to midnight? The clock now stands at two minutes to midnight, and one of the reasons is three years ago they added artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence as a threat to human survival. They genuinely see it that way. The machines are going to take over. Well, I hate to leave you like this, <laughs> but but I, I I I I think the human spirit is something that can't be uh, relegated to artificial intelligence, and that's where our savings will be. Our savior will be 
that and philosophy and religion and, uh, and, and spiritualism. Uh, uh, I'm going to be uh, doing pictures. You and I will be doing pictures. I'll be in the picture room. I'm signing. I'll be here all afternoon. Look forward to seeing you there. Thank you so much. What are you doing, Bill? <laughs> Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you for watching the Convention Junkies coverage of Fan Expo Canada 2018. Join the conversation below with a comment, and don't forget to like and subscribe to see more. If you would like to help us with future projects, please visit our Patreon page.